Hello, everyone. Ah, okay, so yeah, thanks for sticking around. I know it's the end of the day, and I'm also fully aware I am standing in the way of food and drink this evening. Uh, so let's crack on. So a uh, little introduction. Uh, as Steve said, my name is Ross. Um, I'm from a company called Airbyte. Uh, I'm a technical director there, and we're a four-person team based in Reading. Uh, so we're a mobile-focused uh, product studio, and we build products and platforms for a wide range of brands and companies, as well as a number of our own internal ventures. And so because of this, we've worked with a range of clients, um, and typically we become really integrated uh, with a number of startups and early-stage companies. If I flick back to that slide, you, we've got you know, huge corporations down to small startups. Um, and so as we've been around for a while now, we've picked up a vast amount of experience in growing uh, these startups and into bigger companies. And this is beyond just engineering. Um, and that's really interesting to us because we're, we're at heart, we're software engineers, just like most of the people in this room. Uh, as companies get larger, it's hard to get exposure to parts of, of the business other than engineering. Um, a lot of people here might, you know, have never even uh, worked in the same office as a lot of their teams across the company. Um, but as we've been working with a lot of fast-growing companies, um, with an outside and sometimes inside perspective, we've had the opportunity to work on all different aspects of a client's business. And, and that's what I'm going to try and share with you today. Um, by the way, these images that I'm getting, I, I literally just Google like selling software. And the, so it's something to think about. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about marketing your mobile product, keeping up engagement. Uh, my hope today is that you take away a better insight into some options for growing your product or shedding some light on some things you, you ought to be focusing on in your products. This might be your company's products or maybe your own little passion projects that you've got on the side. Um, and all of this is really is to just answer the question is how do we give our product the best chance of success? Um, I met uh, a lovely guy yesterday um, at drinks and, and he was kind of talking about a passion project that he's had and, and he's, you know, how can he get, get to the next level? So, so this is quite a common scenario. Uh, you work, you work, you work until launch day. Launch day comes and goes, and you end up in the post-launch depression, where you know nothing's really happening. Essentially, uh, you might have you know got picked up by media or maybe something like that. But then after that, you, you're not really getting much other than this kind of little baseline that you can see there. Uh, we see this really often with our clients, and they typically come to us and ask, you know, how do we avoid this and, and have a bit more traction? And we find that launching a product is, is actually quite often the easy part of the process. Uh, but you know, you don't have to worry. Only you and probably your team will actually remember launch day. None of your customers probably will remember launch day. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people here probably don't remember the day Facebook launched. Um, but you probably remember the day you discovered it. So the challenge that we all have is how do we make our product as discoverable as it can be? Um, and, and how do we make it as presentable as it can be? So firstly, we're going to start with a bit of theory. Um, so we, we need to remember the best type of selling is uh, not selling at all. So it's all about being effective at communicating your problem and your solution. Um, there is no use building the best products in the world if you cannot effectively communicate your problem and your solution. Uh, so a good example of this is if we take Intercom, which essentially is you know, a customer messaging solution. hope not offending anyone who works for Intercom here. But, um, you know, they could easily market it like that, but they don't. They talk about their problem and their solution. So they say, you know, we help improve conversion by making it easier to talk and support your customers. So they can, you can instantly see the benefit of using their product. Um, and obviously, they can then tailor this based on who they're targeting. It might be a marketing manager or it might be a developer. So how do we start to get into this selling, selling mindset? You know, it's the end of the day. We need to get into this, uh, out of this developer mindset and into this selling mindset. Uh, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just have to... Basically, identify your ideal customers and your potential customers and determine how you'd convince them, how you'd convince them to buy your product or, so, or use your product. And this is similar to design and development in the fact that you just have to avoid assumptions. Um, don't make assumptions about your ideal customers. It was probably what shouldn't have been done in the design process, so it shouldn't be done in the marketing process. One way to, that we kind of look to do this is essentially sitting down with as many people as possible. This can be inside, outside the company. Um, and we can basically imagine how these potential customers would find us. Uh, and typically, we try and use evidence to support that. Uh, we can look at competitors, 
could look at our current analytics if we have any. Um, and we try and just make sure we're involving as many people as possible to get a good, a good rounded insight. We also need to think of ways that they will discover our product naturally uh, within their lifestyle. Uh, so this could be, you know, as abstract, it can be as abstract as just saying someone's coming along and searching the app store for a certain amount of keywords um, and even specifying what those keywords would be for that random person. How do you gather this evidence? As I kind of touched on, you can do it based on past customers. Um, obviously, analytics as well is, is going to be a huge one. But also just talking to your potential customers and your ideal customer in real life. So typically, you would have a target customer. And if you're truly solving their problem, they shouldn't have a problem with uh, talking to you about it. And so we advocate getting feedback and making sure you're talking to your ideal customers. And ask them, how do you think that they would discover your product? Um, so now, assume we've, we've got our ideal customer and, and we know who we're targeting. We're going to look at some examples of how um, we can actually implement this and target uh, these, cu these customers. So let's look at the product, uh, product itself. Uh, you know, we firmly believe in, and we've seen a lot of success with these type of things. I know sometimes they come across as a bit gimmicky, particularly in, in games. Um, but it is a really clever and natural technique in ways to encourage people to share your product. Um, and this can lead to you know, a new av an avenue of natural growth. I say natural because it's technically not natural. Um, also, deep linking of content. Obviously, if you're sharing out content that's exclusively only available in your app, um, or it as eventually it leads to people uh, getting visibility of your app, uh, that's great as well. And branch to IO, um, which is owned by Facebook, um, is a good, a good resource for this because they, they help a lot with that. Um, conversion between web and mobile. Uh, and again, you shouldn't really force these ideals in. You should be analyzing your product, analyzing your ideal customer, and seeing if it's a natural fit. And if it is, you should definitely be doing this. Push notifications is obviously a, a huge topic. Um, and this can help uh, grow providing they are utilized properly. Uh, you can use data to ensure they're relevant. And a really good example of this is Birchbox. Uh, if you don't know what Birchbox is, it's a basically a subscription service for health and beauty products. Um, and they use push notifications to basically incentivize people to um, ask for referrals. And these are actually triggered by purchases in store. So they essentially know that you're you know, quite a, um, a firm customer and that you're, you're, you're a loyal customer. And so they try and pick up on that. And also, they utilize a lot of data about you and to try and determine the likelihood of you actually engaging with these push notifications before they even send it to you. And that way, you can always make sure your push notifications are really relevant. So we're going to change tack, come out of the product. Um, you know, obviously, there's, there's way more that you can do, but, but we could go on for days for that. Uh, so we're going to look outside the product and more towards the App Store. Um, so ASO, App Store Optimization, if you haven't heard of it, um, you know, it's got a huge potential, and this is definitely a growing market. We've seen, personally, at Airbike, we've seen a lot of um, potential in this. Uh, so that we've actually created another company called ASO Happy, and that, yeah, essentially we help consult people to make sure that their app store listing pages are and everything around that looks great um, and and can convert really well. The beauty of, and the horror of the app store is that everyone has the same opportunity to make an impression and convince users to download or buy. So there are a number of things that can influence this: quality um, of your screenshots videos, and all of these you really should be utilizing, no matter what level of kind of your app is, whether it's a side project or a, or a hobby, you should be utilizing all of these. Uh, copy, so you know, if, if English isn't your forte or whatever language you're actually publishing, which we'll come on to, uh, you can obviously get help with this. Ratings, it's obviously, you know, everyone looks at ratings, um, and it can give a really good initial impression as to whether an app is successful or not, or looks successful. Localized listings, uh, including screenshots and videos. Obviously, if you're, you know, it sounds obvious, but if you're marketing uh, in foreign countries, you should be targeting those and relating to those. Again, you should be t talking to your customers in those uh, locations and seeing and you know validating your listings to make sure they a make sense and b are convincing enough to convince people to download. Uh, discoverability, you know, obviously it's, it's a long known problem that discoverability pretty much sucks in the App Store. Um, but there are ways around that, and we'll talk about a bit about that a bit more. And recent updates. So um, the guy I was talking to yesterday said, you know, you, you can't really be bothered to update his app uh, because of the effort involved. But we've seen 
consistently that recent updates really help with um, download spikes. Simply the hive of activity can help with this. So descriptions and keywords are super important um, and, and really should be heavily researched. Some tools that you can use, sensortower.com, appanny.com can be used to essentially um, view your competitors and see how they're doing in terms of their keyword matching. Again, think back to uh, that ideal customer and how they would discover your app. You can also use search ads, which we're about to cover, um, and they can actually help you with this. So ads uh, were launched a few years ago now, uh, and to be honest, we've seen varied success in this. So I'm gonna focus currently on the App Store search ads, but um, they all pretty much work similarly. Search ads comes in two flavors, let's say. So we've got basic, that image is really low res, but um, we've got basic, which is as described, and uh, you pay per install, uh, so the cost is generally higher. Um, Apple will also suggest a cost per install based on their competitors and the current keywords that are um, popular for, the, for those type of products. And you can obviously tweak that as desired, but um, we found that suggestions are pretty accurate. Uh, advanced works in similar to most ad buying platforms. So you bid on keywords and terms and you pay the price if your bid wins. Um, but there's also a sense of randomity as well. Ads on the iOS app store uh, are cost per tap. So that is you only pay to get them onto your listing. So you remember how important ASO and that your app listing actually is. Um, so typically you can measure your conversion rate um, with Apple and work out how much uh, you're willing to pay to get that customer taking into account the likelihood that they won't actually convert. Uh, so similarly to other platforms, you can target specific demographics, new or old customers, customers who may have other apps of yours, which is interesting. Uh, you, can, you target keywords based on people's search terms. So this can be exact or broad, so exact ABC, broad can be a, match, a mismatch of that, so CBA or BCA. Um, and so we typically recommend 70-30 split between those, so it gives you kind of a, a bit of randomness to uh, capture broad searches and obviously um, you're not wasting too much money. Uh, you can also exclude matches, so, so for example, if I for some reason created a podcast app called Shazam Podcasts, um, I'd probably want to exclude Shazam because people are looking for that app rather than mine, um, but then I should probably pick a different name. Search matching uh, is where Apple basically suggests keywords and search terms, so that's something that can give you uh, insight over time as to what people are searching for and then eventually clicking on or uh, tapping onto your app. And something to bear in mind is it is a crowded market, so you know podcast apps for, in particular, uh, it is common to see competitors bidding against each other, so this is me searching for Overcast and then Audible is always at the top. They pretty much are always outbidding, even though Overcast runs ads themselves. Um, so yeah, expect to compete, but don't overspend. And uh, yeah, ad success can vary over time simply because there's an invisible criteria that Apple imposes. Um, and this is basically relevancy. So to prevent you from bidding on random terms and to ensure uh, you're matching against relevant searches, uh, and therefore ad success can actually vary over time, and, that, and that's what we've seen. But typically it does actually even out, so it's, it's kind of fair in that, in that regard. And so that covers search ads, and then we're gonna talk a bit more about other techniques. So that, for instance, this is a free technique, you don't have to spend any money to do this. Uh, content marketing, huge, huge topic. Uh, but on the surface, you can and should use appealing content to attract people to your product. And if possible, this should be story-driven, uh, and it should focus on generating value for readers or consumers. Uh, you know, there are aw awful examples of this uh, in the world. Um, for, you know, when you get, you know, some people are like, oh, five ways you can use our product. Um, no one cares. Um, Intercom uh, have a really good, uh, if, you, if you want a kind of good case study for good content marketing, they they've kind of own it. Uh, they strive to provide value to their readers uh, in, in that sector. And only ever so often do they actually plug their own product. Uh, this is to do with kind of the amount of wide range of pro uh, topics that they cover. So they do case studies, they do random abstract reviews on sales and marketing in general. But they also do real world problems and then they kind of filter on and say like, this is how we try and solve it, but there are other ways of doing this. Um, and obviously the result there is that they can highlight Intercom's usage and convert. A completely different um, example is Indie Hackers. Uh, if, you, if you've seen this, this is a community, or if you haven't seen this even, 
This is a community for people uh, kind of like the startup scene, particularly like the Silicon Valley startup scene, and uh, has case studies of startups. Uh, they were actually purchased by Stripe, even though it's just a, basically a, a blog a community or a forum. Um, and the reason was because they can easily highlight how Stripe is useful in, in those products. So uh, they can basically focus on how they deliver value to these companies, and then that's echoed through their content. And remember, this can be done, I'm talking about written con content here, but this can be done on any level. It can be audio, video, um, and you know, going forward, it can be even in virtual space. Another good example of this as well is Cushion, which is a platform for freelancers. Um, and they openly share their hosting costs, which is really, really interesting. Uh, people at the moment are loving the recent surge of openness, open startups, um, where people share revenues. And of course, this depends on, on you know, your company or your, your personal opinion on this. But you, you should consider it, uh, because it does add value in exchange for a bit of exposure. Um, and it also gives a sense of realism and likability, and that's really hard to manufacture. So, um, and this is, and it's super interesting for weird tech people that like that. Uh, so going on a bit more to the community, so obviously engaging with a number of communities that are relevant to your product. So for instance, in the tech products, you've got the Common Four, Reddit, Hacker News, Product Hunt, Indie Hackers. But you've got to make sure that you're sharing your story first most. There is no point going on there um, and trying to engage with people without, again, giving some kind of value, whether that's a story or you've already given some value to that community. And yeah, on that note, you should also remember that it's not about making sales with these communities. It's all about um, asking feedback and getting feedback. This might be your ideal customer, or they might be close to your ideal customers. So. Um, and obviously, they're in the same space. They might actually be able to help you envisage ways that you haven't thought about your product. Um, and obviously, sales might come out of that because they might be the ideal customer. And continuing on with the community, you should actively keep engaging with this community. So if you post on Product Hunt about a new feature, um, don't ignore people that are replying to it. Actively engage and make sure people in your company are actively engaging on these posts, whether it's developers or, or not. And they should be you know, it's basically making sure that people understand that there's real people behind this product. That's the point of these communities. Um, and you can think about how you can continue this into your product. A good example here, hopefully, oh, terrible, but, so this is my drive, um, iOS app, and in the top right, they've got, throughout their sign-up process, they've got an intercom button. Um, and the reason they've got this is simply because their sign-up process is a bit long, but also because they, there's quite a lot of information that they require that's quite specific. So they've always got support on hand. And again, this is just a good way that you can keep, keep that uh, direct channel open uh, for people to even continue conversations across these communities and into your app. PR, so you know, once we're confident that everything looks good on the App Store, once we're confident that we've, we're doing a good push, you may want to think about uh, press releases and PR. Uh, we've had some experience with this. So um, first tip, never pay to get PR. Um, that's, yeah, it's a bad idea. No, in the past, we've seen um, PR is always coming out of long-term relationships, investing with relevant people. So making sure that you're talking to people in the sector that have maybe written or spoken about similar items or in that sector. Um, there's no point uh, doing general PR simply because all you'll get is footfall and probably not many conversions in our experience. Um, and obviously, make sure you're telling the story. That's what's interesting to people. That content is interesting. No one cares who you know, was hired as recently as an MD or somewhere. People want to know about the story behind products. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we've had features uh, a few years ago in TechCrunch. Um, but this was you know, years in the making. It took us actually years to get uh, this feature. And we targeted this reporter. He's got um, experience in that sector. And at the end of it, it wasn't actually worth it because uh, our conversion flow was just not ready for the amount of users that came through TechCrunch. Um, and you know, we kind of lost people all along the way. Um, so yeah, for us, it was a wasted opportunity. But your, your minds are obviously vary with this. We have also done stuff on local scale. So back in Reading, we've done um, stuff with local press. And that, that, because it's relevant, has had a lot more um, in terms of conversion. Traditional billboard marketing ads. Um, 
So yeah, it depends on uh, if you can afford this and if you can target it. So don't go too broad. There's no point in um, doing general billboard ads, ads unless you're absolutely huge. Um, keep it targeted. For instance, if you're developing a podcast app, you should be targeting podcast listeners. Um, and again, you need to make sure that ASO is fully optimized. It's good to be. So you might be picking up that all this kind of does rely on ASO. Not all of it, but some of it relies on ASO being pretty, pretty strong. So you, you want to do this in an iterative way. Um, and do some of these steps stage by stage. And again, with typical ads, you want to think about incentivizing. Why should a user lose context and, and go into your product or you explore your product? Uh, and again, you need to ensure that your messaging that you're using is explaining the story to highlight why your product is, is better or solving the problem that the, that the ideal customer is going to be having. Sales. So when I say sales here, I'm talking about discounts. So we speak anecdotally about running sales. Um, we have run them in, in the past. Uh, basically, we only really run them if we need to get loads of feedback on an app. Uh, we typically drop the price from pay to free because you'll get a huge number of automated blogs and some non-automated blogs picking you up. Um, one app we did it for, we got 9,000 downloads from like one or two, um, simply because it went from free, from pay to free. Uh, but it's, you know, it's important to know uh, you can only really rely on getting footfall to boost other metrics. So for instance, we did that and we tried to boost our ratings to, to make the ASO uh, listing, the App Store listing look great. And obviously sales uh, will lose their impact if you do it too often. Um, you know, people are pretty switched on with this, so people don't want to you know, lose out on, a, on, a, on a, they don't want to spend basically full price if they know it's a bit like buying a pizza, right? Where you, you always think of that two for one deal or that coupon, people don't want to fall into that mindset with, with apps, particularly with your app, because it is such a low margin or low price. So again, if people can see that you run sales all the time, they might be less likely to purchase. And also, the, your current customers might get, get a little hacked off the fact that you, you put a sale on so often and they paid full price. So tracking, obviously, it's important to track everything. You need to use tracking tools to measure your techniques. You need to know where your users are coming from. Uh, the App Store has obviously gotten better with this uh, in recent uh, years, but uh, there are also other simple ways to, to attach campaign data. So you want to use a variety of tracking tools, not just one. Um, and you also want to utilize the notion of campaigns, channels, and attributions. So campaigns might be launch day, new feature, new release. Channels are going to be email, blog, um, you know, or podcast, whatever. And attribution is essentially the conversion and, or tracking the conversion of where your users came from and how they um, became, one, became your user. And why, why do, and well, yeah, so here's the different types of tools. Uh, URL shorteners, obviously. Uh, even just putting that in front of any app store link that you use in your Content or your media will help you kind of uh, attribute where those where those people came from. Analytics uh, to try and see or segment as to where those users come from. Mixed panel to see, you know, who stayed around, why they stay around, and how they engage with your app and your product. And segment, which is a great tool to give you flexibility because it allows you to plug in future analytics platforms later down the line that might be useful. So. All of these techniques can essentially help convert your baseline from this to style of graph to something like this, where we've got you know, a lot of content coming through that, and new releases that can help us push that baseline up. But it's really important to remember to, to track your success and make sure that you're revising it all the time. It's an iterative process, just like development. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of kind of final, final things, and so then food and drinks, don't worry. Um, so yeah, from our experience, we'd say do not spend a shitload to go to a conference, uh, code mobile not included. Um, <laughs> because essentially, if you go to a conference to try and launch your app, uh, n nobody really, really cares, uh, is the harsh truth, apart from you. Uh, you know, sometimes it will get lost in the sea of launches if it's, if it's a huge event, um, and typically you do end up wasting your money because, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we don't advise that. We always advise kind of a softer launch, um, and then smaller investments uh, along the way to try and gauge feedback and talk to people about your product 
rather than trying to go all out and make a big splash. Never expect help or something for free for people. So a good example uh, is with essentially PR or with uh, when you're posting on communities to try and expect people to come and give you free, free advice or free uh, feedback. You should always be engaging with those communities and making sure that you're providing value to that person or business and then they will uh, reciprocate and you'll get it back. Uh, don't bother begging Apple to get, to get featured. Uh, in our experience, this always happens quite naturally. Uh, if you've got a good product or you're using the latest APIs, this, this will help with that. Um, I was at a Apple Tech Talks for tvOS a few years ago, uh, and there was a segment on how to get featured, and everyone got super excited. I've never seen so many people excited in a room. And the reason was is because they just flashed up this email address. And, and you know, you, you can obviously email this, uh, and you should. So app store promotion at apple.com with product details, uh, the category that it's featured in, it should be featured in, and also some details on why you think it should be featured. They'll consider it, but don't email it every week asking about it. Um, you know, all the features that we've been involved in have always been you know, somewhat random in the terms of that we just weren't expecting it. We were just focusing on the product and making sure it's as good as it can be. Uh, don't worry about money later. Uh, Essentially, you need to make sure you're calcula calculating customer lifetime value, so that is how much return you're going to get from a customer, but also how much that uh, customer costs to acquire, the cost per acquisition. If these don't add up long term, uh, you'll likely never get past that flat launch phase because you don't have any motivation or any money to spend um, after that point. And probably most importantly, don't forget customers are com customers. So we were just talking about you know, customer lifetime value and cost per acquisition and all that. Um, but at, at the end of the day, every customer is unique. They all have unique feedback. And uh, you should always be open to that feedback and listening to that and treating every customer um, individually. And then some you know, things you should be doing. Plan early. Make sure that you're, you know, a lot of these techniques, especially the ones around products, you know, require a bit of foresight and a bit of research. Uh, and they should be implemented into your app or business model as early as you can. Um, be inclusive, you know, ensure that you're talking to people from uh, different backgrounds and um, making sure that you're targeting people that you might not expect to be your ideal customer as well. So try and ensure that you're getting a good range of people. Look at how habit-forming behavior is, is formed. Uh, there's some great kind of reading material around that uh, and viral techniques. And then think of how you can engineer that into your product if it's a natural fit. Don't sell, always tell stories. Uh, yeah, we're, we're big advocates of this. So your product might be the best in the world, but it doesn't matter shit if you can't explain it to anyone. Um, you, you need to be able to have a simplified proposition to people you know, that solves a simple problem. And make sure you're building these long-term relationships with these communities, with these people that can help you launch. Like everyone here, they can you know, one day maybe help you out. And in return, I'm sure you can help, you can help them out. Um, and make sure that you're essentially Interact with them as much as, you're po as possible. Don't make assumptions and avoid, um, avo yeah, avoid avoiding your customers, because it's easy to do. Everyone falls into that trap of, um, you know, not wanting to talk to customers because they might change what you're currently thinking. And finally, uh, remember that, like developing a product, this is an iterative process. Uh, think of it just like a feedback loop. Ask your customers how they find you. Uh, what they like about your business, what they don't, what they like about your content, and also, again, what they don't. And refine and focus on these methods that show most promise. You know, we advocate doing a, a range of things, um, a range of these techniques, and then focusing on what works for the, for the customers that you are targeting. Um, and always experiment, but always also stay true to your ideal customer and that problem that you're trying to solve. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's all I've got for today. So, um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. And if you do have any questions on... Uh, ASO or anything like that, I'll be around all week. Thanks. Cool. Does anyone have any questions for Ross? Brilliant. Looks like you've got off, uh, got off very lightly. Thank you very much for that, Ross. Thanks much appreciated. And let's try our appreciation for Ross.